Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this evening, I'm going to take a slightly different tack and state uh, a pressing environmental problem um, that air quality hasn't been improving, and I'm going to try and unpack why uh, that has been the case. Um, so air quality isn't improving, and this is bringing health costs to our society, um, and we need to move things on. So, OK, if you didn't believe me, here is some um, the air quality levels uh, in, in, in Leeds and also in London going back um, to the, the, the 1990s. As you can see that since about 2000, levels of oxides of nitrogen, NOx, haven't been improving. Now, this is important as NOx is a, a powerful greenhouse gas, but it also is one of the main fuels of photochemical smog. Now, a component of NOx is, a, is another pollutant, nitrogen dioxide. Now, this has direct impact on people's health. Um, and levels of this are above air quality standards, and they have d direct health impacts, such as reduced lung function and respiratory disease. So, OK, some of you might be thinking, OK, this might be due to do with growing traffic demand. Well. In Leeds, in the central area, as many other speakers have indicated, due to restrictions in capacity, but also parking space availability, traffic hasn't been growing. So that's not the answer. OK, so what is it? Well, we perceive that there are restrictions on the environmental performance of vehicles, and they should be getting cleaner. OK, so the emission performance of vehicles for every kilometre that they travel has been getting much stricter with time and they're different for petrol and diesel vehicles okay so standards should be set always set to be aspirational but also achievable so the first thing to note is diesel vehicles are obviously dirtier than petrol vehicles and these standards are, uh, are in place but why aren't levels of pollution dropping and improving? And to answer that question, we need to learn a little bit about how the testing conditions for these standards. Okay, so typically, emission, most emission testing in the world is carried out in laboratories. There are very few independent laboratories because these cost upwards of a million pounds to set up and have high operating costs. There are, however, many of these uh, with the motor manufacturers who share very little information about their research programs and their practices. Now, one of the strangest things is the fact that these cars are tested over a test profile. Now, this test, this is a speed profile that vehicles are driven over in this lab. And this test profile is older than I am. It was developed in the, the early 1970s and is obviously very artificial and simplistic. And as it was developed so long ago, cars at this time were, were lighter and less powerful. So critically, the test doesn't really demand vehicles accelerate promptly as we do today. Now, th this is a more realistic driving profile. It's much more changeable, transient um, conditions demanding harsher accelerations. Um, but even this test, which is more realistic, doesn't include some things that you may, in a straightforward way, assume affects emissions, simply road gradient. So there are serious limitations with our approach. And the 900 million vehicles that uh, exist worldwide, well, you know, we, we su know surprisingly little about their, um, their environmental performance, which on the upside for myself, offers many opportunities to try and unlock new understanding and improve the situation. Okay, so how do we go about this? We take a very different approach. Um, back in sort of 2006, we were fortunate to get some um, infrastructure funding. We took a bit of a punt and bought and imported a, this emission equipment over from the States, which I've set up here. And it's a remote sensing approach whereas vehicles drive through it scans through its exhaust plume 
Whilst the system can't measure exactly how much emission is coming out of the tailpipe, what we can do is measure how much of a pollutant, for example NOx, is present in comparison with the amount of carbon dioxide that's coming out in the exhaust. So how much NOx, in another way, how much NOx is emitted for every gram of fuel that's consumed. The system also records the vehicle's number plate, so we know exactly what that vehicle specification is. For example, it's an Audi A4, registered in 2008, and has got a turbo diesel engine. And by matching these two bits of information together, we can really understand what the vehicle fleet, how it's changing, and what its environmental performance is. So, of the observed vehicles that we've seen um, across West Yorkshire in the last couple of years, we've got like 50,000 vehicles that we've surveyed. We've looked, well, what are their rated CO2 emissions? And they've been falling. Motor manufacturers have been doing a good job decarbonising the fleet and improving engines. Um, you might be surprised to see that petrol and diesel have got are falling and are at a similar level when people perceive diesel vehicles to be more carbon efficient. Well, that's because people are buying, diesel cars are typically larger, heavier vehicles. And obviously, you're aware that lugging around extra weight is, especially in stop-start driving, demands more fuel and more carbon is emitted. Also, people are electing for higher powered vehicles, they're also electing to buy diesel vehicles. Okay. So, we just start delving into some of the remote sensing evidence that we've got. First, we'll look at petrol cars and relate those in terms of the standards. And, as you might expect, things have been have fallen with the emission standards and are broadly comparable. The older vehicles, well, Okay, they're a, a bit higher, and that you might expect because they've got, they've been driven a long way, the engine and the emission controls have deteriorated. A very different situation for diesel passenger cars. Broadly speaking, a car that's 10 years old and one that's brand new, when driven around in an urban area where we've been doing our surveys, they generate similar levels of NOx. This is staggering when you consider that the 10-year-old diesel car has probably driven the equivalent of to the moon and is on its way back to Earth. The levels are also way above what the emission standards are. Sadly, and frustratingly for public transport operators, haulage companies, there's a very si similar situation for heavy-duty vehicles. Um, by my calculations, NOx emissions across urban areas have been underestimated by a factor of about four to five times in recent years. So, what can we learn from this? Well, we need to improve the situation. So why is this happening? Well, in urban driving, as a diesel vehicle is driving around an urban area when it's idling and decelerating, the emissions it generates are quite cool. So these emissions actually cool down the emission control devices and they become ineffectual. The vehicles also have to do more prompter, people drive them in a more aggressive way. And these are outside the kind of test conditions for how the vehicle's been optimised. So the emissions they generate are much, much higher. Um, so this is kind of... This, this storybook has kind of been happening in the air quality field. And we now need to, need to move on from this and start picking vehicle technologies that are both benefit both the local environment, but also the global environment. Thank you for your time.